Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to Raising Parents, the Parenting Science Insights podcast. Produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Lab. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Now, let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode. Now, parenting, as we know from our show, is a very difficult task to manage, raising a child while also raising yourself as well. We're talking today about strategies it takes to return to work and manage breastfeeding and the whole situation of having a child while also working and building up your career and people saying that you can't have it all, but there are people, some people saying that you can manage to find ways to have what you want in life as well as having a child. Um, today, we're joined by Dr. Jennifer Aton, who has research experience of 25 years in extensive clinical background in midwifery and nursing. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining me today. You're welcome. Great to be here. So can you tell me a little bit about how you got into extensive research and how you got into researching both midwifery and, and nursing and what you found most passionate about it? Um I was working in the UK as a midwife and um, was always really interested and of course that was my field of, of clinical work um, and I'd spent some time in, the, in uh, Ethiopia and realised how much we don't know about so many things and um, just had a real desire to actually do the research around uh, about mothering, about fathering. Um, about breastfeeding and just the inequities that we face in society. So, um, and of course, I'm more interested in both the physiology of how things work, but also as I've got a bit older and gone deeper into the research, I'm particularly focused on sort of some of the social aspects of why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And why is it important for us to sort of talk about balancing breastfeeding and going back to work and why is it such a big thing for us to even have this show on today to talk about it? This show is fantastic because it, what it does, most importantly, is start a conversation. So we start talking about some of the real issues that are facing parents today. Um, often this sort of conversation is hidden. Um, it's something that we don't tend to talk about uh, because it's seen as a mother's job or a female-dominated job. And so we don't tend to talk about those and have really open conversations about it. Um, and so airing this um, is really important because it also shows that there's lots of different perspectives, lots of different ways of looking at this problem and allows parents to actually see that and normalise um, some of the realities that are actually taking place for people today. Mm -hmm. And I think like, especially when it comes to, I mean, you talk about it being a mother's job, especially when it comes to, you hear a lot of, you see a lot of shows and watch a lot of movies when it comes to a mother going back to work and how she's treated differently because she's also a first time mother or a new mother and she's having to balance building her own career and while also realizing that she is a parent, that she is looking after somebody else and she can't be that um, career focused woman without that part of her as well. So I think when you're talking about bringing it up as a conversation, we often see it so in a, in a very particular situation of the negative side that comes on to it without really looking at the positives that sort of can be had when going back to work as a first time mother and also balancing um, breastfeeding. I think breastfeeding is something that we don't talk about. Yeah at all, not just we're going back to work, but also at all, it's not something that you hear in a normal conversation when it comes to, unless you're surrounded by first time mothers, that is the last thing that you sort of really talk about. 
Yeah, absolutely. That um, really touches on the fact that it's hidden. It's hidden away. So we have breastfeeding rooms that are like are not even named up as breastfeeding rooms. They're often named up as feeding rooms. And so for some really interesting reason, we're very uncomfortable with breastfeeding as a society. Um, there's lots of theories on why that is, but as you say, the, just that open conversation about breastfeeding and actually seeing it take place, uh, particularly in the workplace, um, is really important. No, yes, I completely agree. It's such a interesting thing about managing both yes. and about being a, a mother and um, people realizing people around you who sort of seen you as a career oriented person somehow flip a switch and also become, okay, I'm also a parent, also raising a child. I'm also having to do certain things and also be there for ki for my kids in ways that I can't hundred percent focus on work. So I think this conversation is going to be such a good one today. And I'm very excited to talk about it a little bit more, but before I do, we love to start off getting to know you and getting to know your interests, um, just sort of personalizing the whole show to you rather than just topic. So we like to play a little icebreaker to get us started and it's called, have you met Dr. Jennifer? So it's just a little thing. So when I share the first phrases that come to mind, just go ahead and say whatever comes to your mind as well. Okay. So the first one is a favorite book of yours. This thing comes to mind is one I'm reading at the moment. It's called At the Pond. And, mm -hmm. it's, ab and it's about um, a pond in the UK that people have been, women have been swimming in for decades. And, it was, and it's a women's only swimming pond. And so mm -hmm. it's all the different stories about what swimming in this water means through the seasons, particularly cold water swimming and how it's helped women negotiate different um, events in their lives. From being a mother to losing a parent to losing a child to um, all sorts of things. And so it's just a beautiful book. Wow, I've never even heard of that ever being mentioned. So that is, that is something that I'm going to have to look up straight after the show and look into a little bit more because that sounds really interesting in terms of the different situations that women themselves find find ourselves in and having to deal with in, in a different way than I think other um, other genders do as well. I think mothers are very, and women are very specific in what we have to deal with. So it is very interesting to see, to hear that book, um, even being written. The second one is a favorite movie that you have. Um. It's Jane Eyre, actually. It's, um, it's a favourite because it's a really hard movie to watch, but and it's also a beautiful book to read. It's beautifully written. Um, and it shows the reality. Again, it's all around the theme of women. And it shows the reality of how powerful women can be and some of the adversaries they face. Um and just, it's just such a beautiful moving uh, movie. So that is actually one of my favorite books to read as well. It's a very interesting, um, it's amazing how well they adapted the movie to the book and how specific it was. So when I saw the movie, I was amazed at how everything that I pictured when reading the book was exactly how other people pictured it and how it was, um, featured and how it was visually drawn in and no I can definitely see how Jaina is one of your favorite movies because it is definitely on one of my big top lists. Uh, the next one is a favorite podcast that you have. Oh it's one that I've listened to recently um, uh, with Esther Freud and uh, Interestingly, she has written a chapter in the book At the Pond um, and it's about her mother and her childhood. So she, Esther Freud is the, I think, is the granddaughter of um, uh, the well-known painter who, I just forget, her father. No, so she's the daughter of um, a well-known painter and she's also related to Sigmund Freud. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so the podcast is about her mother as um, a mother who, as as a woman who sort of severed her relationship with her family so that she could just make the choices that she needed to make and she became a single mother. Um, again, it's around mothers, women. Uh, um, uh, she became a single mother and actually uh, in London in the 40s and endured all sorts of different things. But it's a story of triumph. But it's Esther Freud's um, ability. Her, it's about her writing and about her experience of growing up with um, her mother and her her um, her dad, who is this famous painter, and what that's like. So yeah, that's my favourite podcast at the moment. Wow, that is that is a very in depth and only something that she could possibly do, sharing her experience. So that that is that is very cool. Um, the next one is a famous role model that you have. Oh, that's a famous role model. It could um, be, it doesn't have to be famous. It could be I, famous to you. I think my greatest role model was actually my daughter, to be honest. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And my sons, really. So I had three children, uh, um, two boys and a girl, and they would be my role models, to be honest. Wow. I could, you should definitely um, send this to them. <laughs> the high praise <laughs> that you would get after that. <laughs> oh, don't tell them. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't tell them. Never, never tell them. <laughs> But is there something um, particular that you sort of find very um, such a good role model of character or is it something specific? I think the, the, actually what they've taught me and how patient they've been with me as a parent, um, also just their endurance to uh, negotiate life at the moment um, and strength. Really, I think that's sort of three things, and the vulnerability. It just, particularly the boys being being so open and so free with their vulnerability is really empowering. I think mm-hmm. it's empowering for my daughter. Um, it's also vice versa. So um, that they think that that's okay to be vulnerable and to talk openly about it, which is fantastic. So um, gives me a great deal of hope that. You know, that's there, particularly when we're in a society where we're trying to move towards um, uh, sort of an equal partnership around sharing sort of vulnerabilities and particularly Mm -hmm. around men being vulnerable. Um, I think it's, you know, it's quite inspiring. And they openly sit down and read things like um, Simone de Beauvoir and... Um, talk about feminist issues and debate it, and which is terrific. No, that is that probably is a big testament to how you raise them as well. I think that's a big part of it. Um, to be able to share that vulnerability as well as something that's not easy for everyone to do. So no, that is that is incredible to see and to hear. I mean, it gives me hope as well, and I'm probably in the s- similar age bracket to them as well. So <laughs> it's it's very good. Um, the next one is a favorite course that you've completed. I would have to say, and many people who've done this wouldn't share my enthusiasm, but my PhD was probably my favorite because I had so much autonomy and I thrive on autonomy and, um, yeah, that was probably my favourite, and I was uh, I was mature enough to know that it was okay not to know mm-hmm. and be happy with that. And um, like I said, I just had so much autonomy with how I did it, and um, felt quite empowered. And the the um, one of the keys I think was that I was able to um, listen to so many women's stories when I was doing my PhD, because that was part of it, that it just felt, I felt so privileged to be led into the world. So, yeah, PhD is a course, believe it or not. (laughs) I've heard so many people say a PhD is pretty much your entire life and somehow you fit your entire life into about six to eight years of 
of your whole experience. So no, I um, it's something I have probably have to look forward to. So which is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, great. Now, talking about parenting, talking about the journey as a woman, the journey as a parent, and sort of what to expect. I know that everyone has a very different definition as to what parenting is to them and what is important when being a parent. So what do you think your definition or your terminology of parenting is to you? Great question. Um, do you know when you Google parenting, it comes up with um, a person who gives birth and raises a child. Um, and what's so interesting about that definition is that it's about one person. It sort of states that it's all about one person. Whereas for me, and particularly the research that I've done, parenting is actually um, it's a shared practice. Um, it's a cooperative, if you like. It's and there's a term that's often used called allo parenting. It comes. It's an anthropological sort of approach where. Parenting is a, a, a collaborative, it's it's shared between a group of people, it's not one person's sole responsibility. Um, and what makes it so different from any other role that we do in our lives is that it's uh, anchored in love and it's also full of care and responsibility and there's lots of different tasks attached to it. But essentially, I think for me, parenting is that allo parenting, it's a shared cooperative um, it's not something that one person does, that it's gendered. It shouldn't be gendered. Mm -hmm. No, I I think parenting, especially when you come at like that, allo parenting is such a big thing. And especially in this day and age, I feel like the whole gender role and gender specific task that sort of comes about is not something that we really focus on but somehow we still do in the workplace, which is very interesting to me. Like that's one thing, one area that we still haven't really changed our ideology in. Mm. Um, we talk about parenting so often. I mean, obviously this is a parenting show. And we talk about parenting so often, but we always talk about it as if it's one person raising a child or it's a just two people raising a child. We had an episode on a whole community taking part in raising their children and raising what it's expected of them. And I think everyone has a very different understanding depending on, I think, one, your location and two, who you surround yourself with. Everyone has a very specific definition as to what parenting is and what it looks like for everyone. And Ello Parenting, I think we've mentioned a couple of times on the show, and it is it's very interesting to see that it's something we do and we know, but it's not something that we take place in in a workplace. And is still there's still that very gendered area as to how both men and women are treated when going back to work after after a child has come and joined into their lives. The way that a man is treated is very different to how a woman is treated. And it's still very interesting to me as to how that can still take place even after we know. We learn all these different new terminologies and we understand the um, non-gendered roles, specific tasks that we want to do, but it's still something that takes place in today's society. So it's it's definitely something that's very interesting to me and I could probably get wrapped up in talking about that for so long, but I won't. I know that we're talking about it a little bit further and I love to hear your opinion a bit more. Um, talking about first parenting and being your first, having your first child, um, even getting into that transition and that mindset of being a parent, what do you think that expectant parents need to be aware of in their transition to parenthood? Um, I think, as you said, it's, it's, a, um, it's one of these amazing roles that, um, and I use the term role really loosely, um, that uh, it's such a privilege and it's an, a sort of major life event and it's a major life stressor. Um, it's interesting because it's one of the – I always think about um, parenting and work as something that's, you know, it's like the parenting is one of the biggest jobs in the world. It's, it's like you're the CEO of, of everything. It happens to be one of the lowest paid, hardest, 
with the longest days, unrecognised care jobs. There's very little opportunity for promotion. And so when you, but at the same time, it's incredibly rewarding in so many ways that we cannot measure. And it really differs in your work, your employed or paid care um, because of the love and ongoing life commitment you have to it. Um, and it's one of those few jobs that you, you actually don't really need a qualification for and there's no job description. And so for parents trying to prepare for this and, um, and what to expect, it's really hard. It's like this new ground that they're breaking. They can hear all the stories from all their friends and their family, but because it changes depending on your job and your context, um, it's really hard to prepare for. Um, so, and everything we've had up to that date has sort of been in our control. And so, we had control over relationships to a degree, our bodies and um, our house, our income to a degree. But when you become a parent, that all changes pretty quickly. You soon realize that you've got less control over your body, your sleep, your income changes, your relationships change, everything sort of changes. And I think just thinking about it in that sense, the change is coming, that it's not something that I'm just going to fit into or the baby's going to fit into, that it's change and the change is so varied. Um, and so I guess expectations really are important. So thinking about what the expectations are um, for, for work and for, you, for what you think parenting is going to look like. I always talk about parenting as thinking about it, well, what do you want your parenting to look like? And it's a decision that that sort of question has to come over and over and over again. You have to think about it over and over and over again because you have to ask yourself, well, what do I want returning to work look like? What do I want first day of school to look like for me and for the child? What do I want breastfeeding to look like for me? And that, I think, helps you centre it on yourself and it's all about you having the discussion, um, you know, having the conversation with the people in your life um, and then knowing what support networks are out there. Again, it's about it's a collaborative, it's a shared practice, so sort of tapping into that. But first you've got to know what you want it to look like and mm -hmm. then you can have the conversation um, because parenting uh, is so dynamic and so changeable um, and the skills you learn and develop as a first-time mum or, or, or dad um, in the first couple of weeks uh, um, are going to set you up for later on down the track. And so thinking about it as cumulative, so all the things you're learning, both good and not so good, um, the hard stuff, um, actually does set you up for when you get a call at um, one in the morning. Um, hmm. <laughs> that yeah. you have to go pick your child up <laughs> or that they come to you and say that they're sad, that they're depressed or or someone else tells you that, which is a reality in everyone's life at the moment, you know, more so. Um, building that those foundation skills but being uh, asking yourself what does this look like for me, what's it going to look like is really important. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, you're definitely right in terms of the changes that will occur, especially when it comes to relationships. And I've noticed that when I had um, a lot of friends, when they had their first child, the social calendars sort of dimmed down a little bit. They weren't going out as much. They weren't able to hang out at certain times. Pretty much their life revolved around the child's nap schedule and the child's eating schedule and just being aware of the fact that they need a transition into their new routine is very um, interesting, especially when it comes to the feeding time. Because the uh, there's one friend of mine whose child just would not stop crying, would not, if it knew that it was hungry, if it knew that it needed to be fed, if it knew that that's the time was to be expected, you could hear it on the phone just constantly crying, constantly whining. And then um, so the conversation would be cut short. So there's a certain time where she's able to call and she's not able to call. And I think we sort of really 
don't think about those little things when it comes to being a parent. You think about the big things like, oh, the baby's first laugh, the baby first walking, but you don't think about the schedule that needs the routine that they're really needing and that structure that they're really relying on in terms of what to be expected in each and every day. And the fact that you cannot change it, not even for a second, not even for like 10 minutes, it cannot be delayed. Um, Cause that's what a child expect the baby expects, for example. So in terms of the feeding schedule, in terms of breastfeeding, what is the definition of breastfeeding and what are some key benefits associated with this method of feeding an infant? So breastfeeding is incredibly complex, um, which is why I've spent most of my career of researching, <laughs> doing research around it. So loosely breastfeeding um, uh, is feeding uh, breast milk uh, or feeding directly from the breast. There are multiple different types of breastfeeding. Uh, there's mixed, there's exclusive, there's any, there's uh, there's so many different types. And so we have these formal sort of epidemiological definitions that help um, us measure the trends in breastfeeding, so what people are doing. Um, but like I said, essentially it's incredibly complex because it's a practice, it's an embodied practice. It's something that comes from within, that's made from within and then shared um, across two bodies. And if it's really a collaborative practice, it's often shared across multiple bodies um, in some settings, multiple people f feed each other's babies. Um, and that practice actually happens here in Australia too. So there's shared feeding that, that happens. Um, and so it's got, um, it's mainly because breastfeeding is, has always been seen as something that's life saving and life giving. It creates an intimate bond. Um, because of the sharing of the the embodied sharing of the milk, um, um, it involves more than, like I said, more than the individual. So it involves the mother, the infant, the family, society in general. Um, and and in the work that I've done bef previously, I found that women don't and families don't actually ascribe to the definitions that we we give it as health professionals or in the public health documents, they, um, such as exclusive breastfeeding, which is when the babies only feed breast milk and nothing else, um, but they just, they practice breastfeeding in ways that suit themselves and their families. And if that's probably what we need to sort of embrace more, that we need to allow women and their families and I deliberately use the term women in, in here because women are the ones who are producing the milk, the lactating and um, producing the milk, um, because it gives them more autonomy over their practice and what they're doing. And so we know that breastfeeding, it is really important as a society that we have the conversation and that we actually talk about it and that we talk about the benefits of it or the things that we need to do to support women and their families breastfeed. Um, we know that there's substantial um, evidence that the supports the power of um, breastfeeding and providing a breast milk, um, such as reducing the risk of really common childhood diseases, um, particularly in the first six months of life, um, and that it's dose dependent. Uh, that means that the longer, the more you breastfeed, and the longer you breastfeed, the greater the benefits are to everyone. Um, so ear infections, diarrhea, respiratory tract infections, diabetes, childhood obesity. It's re it's there's powerful, uh, very good research that shows that there's a decreased risk in developing those. Um, so that means less time off work, less uh, hospital admissions, shorter shorter durations of the illness, if you like to, if they do contract one of the um, condition uh, diseases. Um, it also reduces cardiovascular disease and ovarian and invasive breast cancer for the mother, which is often not talked about, which is really important to. Uh, um, and it's actually a climate smart food, so there's less packaging and less waste, um, so it's environmentally sustainable. 
Um, and it's also cost effective. So it's estimated that about um, breastfeeding or continued breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding in those first, you know, four to six months actually saves the Australian economy about $120 million annually. Wow. And so for all those reasons, um, it's a really important sort of health message, but it also is important. Um, it's important important to support because women and their families want to do it and that's actually reason enough it's a very it's a very interesting when i was sort of reading through the questions um that whole okay what's the definition of breastfeeding it felt so silly to even ask it but it's so intrin intrinsic and there's so complex as to how to define it. Yes, okay, we know what it is. A lot of people know. They're probably sitting here listening. Why did you ask what the definition of breastfeeding is? But there's so many things that sort of go into it in a scientific sense that that take a lot more of an understanding rather than just say, okay, it's a practice that it's what we're supposed to do. It's what women are supposed to do. Um, again, like you said, I use women as a sort of autonomic sense as to what would happen, but it, it's what a mother would do breastfeeding is such a natural thing, but the scientific definition behind it as to why do we breastfeed, why is it important, is such a, really is needed to be understood. And I think because we don't understand why it's important, we don't talk about it. And I think seeing that scientific side really um, helps us understand why it's so natural to be talking about it, why it should be a natural part of conversations, because it's, it's a very, um, it's a scientific thing. It's, yes, it's what happens is what we're supposed to say, but it's such a specific area that we need to really understand. And to be able to understand it, we need to sometimes ask those silly questions, I think, as to what the definition of breastfeeding is. So yeah, that is amazing. And now we're gonna be talking about the going back to work aspect of a breastfeeding mother and sort of what's to be expected. Now, how does the decision to breastfeed impact a mother's ability to return to work? Um, this is huge. <laughs> um, as I said, um, breastfeeding, as in some sense, it's, it, it, there's, it's just not compatible. To breastfeed, to feed your baby enough milk and meet all the needs of the baby in the first sort of six weeks of life. So, for example, if you had to return to work in those first six weeks and you wanted to keep breastfeeding, you would need to be expressing six to eight times a day to sometimes 12 times a day to get enough milk to completely feed, to feed that baby or get donor milk in if you wanted to breastfeed, you know, provide breast milk for your baby. Couple that with doing everything you have to do, like go to work, meet all the demands of work, um, and then come home and express while you're at work. Come home and then feed your child overnight as well as anything else that you need to do. It's also just not, it's just not compatible. It's, it, women are exhausted doing something like that. Um, and so, on the other hand, if we see it as that collaborative practice where it is a shared responsibility and so that means that the policies in workplace policies, governments enable families to negotiate the demands of breastfeeding so they will need to feed their babies every three hours or express for that many, uh, much time, particularly in those first six weeks to get them breast milk established, breastfeeding established, um, means that policies and governments need to get on board with that and actually enable women and their families to negotiate the space. And so having open policies that allow that and the, the, the change the change that's going to happen on the 1st of July where it increases the from 18 weeks of paid maternity leave to 20 weeks of parental leave may go to some, may help some, but there's still limitations there because it's only really that we haven't thought about the women who are in temporary employment, who are in casual employment, insecure employment, 
who have workplaces that that they they cannot stop and feed their babies or they can ha- not have their babies brought in to ha- have them fed and also just the choice the demands of needing to work um, and job insecurity so we haven't really thought about that and we haven't actually as you've ta- said before we haven't taken on board what breastfeeding is so haven't taken on board that breastfeeding requires more than time off it requires that commitment that so if the mother only takes time off yes she can stay at home and breastfeed but then she's isolated what she needs is that flexible space where her partner can support her as well and so if he's in a high power job or if he's doing shift work he's not going to be around to support her in those first because it's a shared parental leave mm-hmm. and so He's not going, or they're not going to be around to be able to provide that support, that um, an investment that's needed as a couple in that during that really intense time, which is usually in those I suppose, six to twelve months, really. And so, um, so there's some of the really sort of the hidden challenges that we don't tend to think about. There's negotiating which pump to get. Um, you know how they're going to what it's going to look like for them again sort of thinking about what that is um, how long they would like to feed for and that might change once they start breastfeeding um, what sort of how they're going to manage their career so are they taking a, a short break in their career to be able to negotiate this so there's all these little hidden things apart from just the day-to-day uh weariness that actually happens from negotiating this and trying to juggle both aspects of of your life which we shouldn't be seeing as separate we should be seeing it as as something that goes hand in hand really Mm -hmm. no i think it's such a big thing and i think you're right and definitely we need to understand what breastfeeding is in order to really see okay it's more than just having paternity leave it's more than just having that it's dealing with not only the um the emotional sense emotional exhaustion that would come from having to take care of a being able to feed a child constantly whether it's you prepare it beforehand or you feed them instantaneously there's that huge sort of um understanding that there are so many ways and i think a lot of people would be asking um, I mean, I'm I'm sort of thinking about it as well in terms of, okay, why can't we just give the baby a for- formula or the powdered baby milk while we're at work and then sort of switch in between? Or is that something that, is that something that we don't usually do? And why isn't that something that we can use as a substitute for, um, I think, breast milk directly f- um, while we're at work and sort of preparing that? Um. It's, they're really great options for women and their families, absolutely. If the mother and the family, okay, it comes back to the what do we want breastfeeding to look like and if you go back to the definition of what breastfeeding is, which is feeding the child the breast milk or at the breast, mm-hmm. um, and some of the benefits of, of doing that, particularly in those first 12 months, so the risk of, it's not even a risk, but the introducing of a, a um, a formula to the baby interrupts the mother's milk supply and so by not taking milk off the breast um, either expressing or the baby feeding decreases the amount of volume that the mother will make so it's this hand in hand that's why it's so embodied because it's hand in hand the more m- m- milk is taken off that it's then replaced if it's not taken off then it's not replaced and so the mother's supply dwindles down and so that's one of the key reasons why a lot of women stop breastfeeding is because they um, feel that their milk supply is um, dwindling and so they will introduce a formula um, to supplement the feed. There's also um, problems for some children don't tolerate the formula um, when, you know, they there's a certain uh, – they might have a reaction to the formula or it changes subtle things within the the – their um, gastrointestinal system um, and I think I said earlier that the 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 more the babies breastfeed 
the longer the baby is breastfed, the greater the benefits, so the less risk of the um, associated infections, what's not. And so there's all those things to consider. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's um, but probably what's important here is that it's what the family is choosing to do. So if they really want to breastfeed their child and not introduce formula at all, particularly in those early sort of stages where we're setting up, um, it's almost like setting up the baby's system for the future, um, then uh, enabling the family to do that um, and they may choose not, not want to use formula milk and formula is actually quite expensive as well, um, then we need those structures in place to support them to do that um, and you know, including these sort of emotional supports. And um, our, some of our earlier work showed that if the partner was um, 100% um, behind the choice to breastfeed, um, then they were more likely to continue to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. But if they were really indifferent and didn't really mind, then that increased the chances of not breastfeeding for any for an extended period of time. So mm -hmm. the most important person behind there is the partner. That's and certainly our work that we've done around returning to work has shown that too. They are the number one key support that for each other um, when returning to work when doing any sort of paid employment. Um, and sometimes we refer to breastfeeding as unpaid care or unpaid work because essentially that's what it is. Mm -hmm. There's no monetary value. The government, when we do all the uh, fiscal counting around this, we don't, we don't think about it um, in, a, in the terms of reducing hospital admissions and return of keeping mums um, in a happy place if they're working, reducing illnesses, et cetera. So... Mm. And in terms of the partner and the partner's role um, in supporting the breastfeeding mother, what role do they play in supporting a breastfeeding mother who is returning to work? And sort of what are some practical tips for balancing the demands of both being a parent and focusing on a career as a couple? So the partner, like I said, is absolutely key. Um, in all our work, we've shown that they are absolutely integral to the emotional support of the, of the mother, to the, the concept of the shared sort of practice, um, but also for themselves. So them building their relationships so, um, uh, is really important for them. And so a lot of uh, families tend to negotiate the feeding with mum expressing and the partner feeding. So mum goes can, working and vice versa and sometimes other methods of feeding are introduced at that point too um, and so that's all that part of that allo um, parenting. Mm -hmm. So they are really important um, but what we don't do very well is and we're currently building more research around this as others are building research in this area too is trying to understand what the partners actually need to do this. So what their experiences are, what they actually, what are the skills they need? Because we can't assume that the skills that the the mother needs to breastfeed are exactly the same as what a father or the, or the partner would need. Um, the men in the studies that we've done um, who have been involved are, are deeply committed to supporting their partners um, but feel, as the mothers do as well, there's a certain stressor that happens. Um, we talk about that as work, um, uh, work uh, where we talk work interviews with family and family interviews with work. So there's a sort of a theory around the stresses that are starting to impact and so they negatively have an impact on breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we can support the partner and that means workplace policy have to name up that, that the partners are equally supported as well as the mothers are, then perhaps we might move things forward. Um, whereas currently they're not actually, they're ignored in workplace breastfeeding support policies. The Partners mm. Act aren't really sort of named up or included. Um, and so some of the things that we need to do, um, 
One of the studies that we did recently, we the parents actually are incredibly creative with how they manage uh, this uh, phenomenon of uh, juggling work, family, and paid work, family, and unpaid work of caring and breastfeeding. And so, um, breastfeeding needs to be taken separately away from un, uh, uh, from other caring responsibilities because of what we've described before about all the other elements that go with breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the parents came up with um, four really key things that they needed to help them negotiate uh, this space, and that was um, flexibility. So they need flexibility in the workplace and they needed flexibility at home. And so they can control that flexibility at home, but they can't control the flexibility at work. Mm -hmm. They need to know what their rights are, so they need to be able to get in and actually understand in a really transparent way what their their rights are, including um, rights to leave. and, And that, of course, like I said before, really depends on their type of work that they're doing. So, and the site of their work, so uh, how easy it is for them to leave work if they need to or negotiate or bring a baby into work, um, like, for example, on the work site. You know, if the mother's working on a work site, it's going to be pretty difficult to bring a baby in and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, Preparation and planning, so they need to be able to prepare, um, figure out what they need to do, what breastfeeding looks like or what caring looks like, what this whole situation is going to look like. But that also includes negotiating and having conversations with their employers um, and the facilities, so the built environment. Mm -hmm. So that built environment is really important. Um, And again, it really depends on the, the context. They can control their own built environment, but they can't control to a degree, but they can't control the built environment of their workplaces and so some we need to be thinking about what that looks like from a policy and a practice level of how safe how we can make those environments that people work in safe for families to be able to manage this feeding within the early days um so and they're really important four things because they came from what the parents were doing at the time and so they've been driven at, that they've been developed up through our research, but they came from what the parents were doing and the advice that parents would be giving to other people who um, who were nego- going in to negotiate this sort of space for themselves. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to that space and having that sort of voice to be able to know what's to be expected what are some of the resources and even like some of the support networks that are available um, to breastfeeding mothers who are returning to work? Because I know that there are going to be a whole group of people who sort of have a a better understanding and a bit, bit more experience than a first-time mother who is just trying to learn how to balance the both of it. So what kind of support network is available? I know this is going to be probably specific to Australia, Um, but what are some that you know of that you can sort of recommend to our audience? So I think one of the sort of organisations that does a really good job in this space um, is the Australian Breastfeeding Association, Um, and I have no financial ties to them, so I'm purely as a – so there's no conflict of interest here at all. So they have amazing resources um, and they're well trained and they're well, uh, you know, relatively well funded to support breastfeeding families. And so they have um, uh, accessible, but through a phone call or a text message. And so they also have resources online in multiple languages. The wherever the parents are based, often there will be supports, organisational supports, like from the hospital or if they're having feeding problems or um, local support networks such as um, parenting support groups, um, uh, lactation consultants that are around within their their services if they're having problems, or um, again, there's sort of the local sort of ABA, Australian Breastfeeding Association support groups. They're sort of those sort of top-level organisation ones. 
um, one of the research tells us that other women and other families are number one. And so peer to peer support is seen as really uh, is more powerful. Mm -hmm. And so establishing that network or having that network, seeking out the network, including um, talking to other mothers at work. And so again, our research found that um, when women, they created their own little networks at work um, where that they would speak to other fathers. The fathers of, often did it as well. So fathers would talk to other fathers and share their sort of resources. Um, and these were sort of personal, interpersonal resources. They're not necessarily equipment of any sort, um, right down to what's the best pump to actually mm -hmm. buy, to buy. And so I think if I was going to rate those, I'd be rating peers first and then organisational support first because I think you can access your peers sometimes. Uh, there's a, a level of trust that's already there, um, but also you can establish that level of trust with an organisation like ABA. Then individual workplaces, they have their policies, so finding out what they are, um, asking managers what they are, um, uh, including your leave retirements. And then the Australian Government Services Australia website has a lot of resources around or it just sets out very clearly what leave entitlements um, returning to work looks like for parents. Um, and so does the Fair Work um, Ombudsman's website, what those leave entitlements are. So they're all really sort of solid um, resources that are around. Um, there's lots of other looser ones. Um, I, I always sort of caution against doing the Google because there's so much information. Yep. And so I would go to sort of trusted sources like um, ABA, your peers, um, the workplace, um, and the government websites to really find out the concrete information that you need to know and then go to the more looser ones because everyone – as the listeners will, will attest to, has an opinion on this. And you sort of have to put this sort of filter on. Mm -hmm. I call it the crap filter. So you have to put the crap filter on. <laughs> oh, that is the best definition for that. <laughs> <laughs> and sift out what is relevant to you and sort, yeah. of, sort of park everything else. Mm -hmm. No, I think especially when it comes to something as – you like talking about policies, talking about the amount of leave that you're required to have in terms of paternity leave and things like that. Um, I think there's no one I, I would trust more than someone who's already going through it or who has already done the research and who has already sort of looked it up because they have a better understanding as to what it's sort of like a practice what you preach kind of thing. So it's like practice. They've already done the situation. They've already done, gone through it. So I think when it comes to, I love learning from people rather than learning from like Googling and websites. I'd rather, my first thing is just to go and ask someone else what they're, um, especially when it comes to like legal advice or um, what your fair work is. And fair work is such a, if you don't, if you're not from Australia, fair work is a huge government um, website where you sort of look up what you're allowed as an employer or an employee, what sort of we go through. So that's relevant to our country, but they'll be slightly different, I think, in terms of different countries around the world, wherever you're listening. So yeah, it is a very good thing, I think, to look for sort of peer-reviewed sites and not just Wikipedia because we don't take Wikipedia for anything other than the crap filter. So I'm using that from now on. I'm going to be using that. <laughs> <laughs> now, when it comes to going back to the workplace and sort of being in communication with your employer uh, in terms of what you're needing and what the breastfeeding mother is being able to need, how do you communicate with them in terms of what they want to achieve and what is also needed for them in order to come back to work safely and with a better peace of mind? Um, that's actually quite hard, I think, because there's a power imbalance immediately. Mm -hmm. um, 
but equipping yourself with um, what the policies are, um, knowing what they are in the work in your workplace, what your leave entitlements, all of those things are, sort of helps you build a case, <clears throat> um, and knowing what you want your breastfeeding to look like. Um, mm-hmm. So those three things are probably really important before you even start, and then having that conversation really early. So having it in when you're pregnant, um, when and uh, with your manager, um, and. And that might, but you need to actually know what all the other things are first before you can have that that uh, conversation with your manager. What's really needed, I think, when they when women do come back to work, and there's no reason why women have to and families have to choose between work and receiving their child, mm-hmm. which is what's actually happening in a lot of the cases. That's certainly we've certainly found in our work that that's that's what women were doing. They were choosing to either breastfeed and continue to breastfeed or return to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so having the conversation with the manager to enable you a safe place uh, where you can actually express if you choose to express at work, a safe place for your partner to bring your baby in um, if you want to feed during work, um, uh, how that will work for the for the organisation, um, if um, they're probably the sort of basic. Um, in reality, for a lot of people, um, it's much harder than that. I'm not saying that it's not done, but having those conversations with the manager to begin with and all workplaces should have a lactation policy, uh, a returning to work sort of lactation policy, and they should be able to provide a room, a PowerPoint, a fridge, more than sort of those basic necessities. Um, <laughs> in reality, often those, often those spaces are either a broom cupboard, a toilet. Um, what else did we hear? We had broom cupboards, toilets, um, the shared uh, workplace, your workplace uh, desk, um, the shared lunch fridge. Um, and so, uh, like I said, that conversation about what that is in pregnancy is much safer for you than having to have that conversation when you're in the middle of expressing and trying to find somewhere to put your milk. Um, mm-hmm. and and a lot of people don't, aren't comfortable with putting it in the lunch fridge. Um. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think one of the things that I, when you're going back to work, for example, you're applying for jobs, and I think that's one of the big things when you go back to work. You're not always starting from the position that you already had. You, sometimes it could be from another job or working at another office, How do you have that conversation at the beginning of like applying for jobs or the interview? Should you have that quest those questions as part of your interview questions for the employer in terms of what to expect? Absolutely. I think that's really important. Um, asking them what their return to work work policies are for families. Mm Um, asking what they are, what they entail, and um is really important. So that sets it on the agenda. Um, I'm always really conscious that a lot of families aren't in a position where they can do that. So again, the temporary employment, um, uh, casuals, um, they are, are sometimes placed in a position where they can't have those conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but having that conversation or naming that up is really important um, and asking them to send them the policy and what they're going to do to support them to manage the their family situation is part of the employer's responsibility. So mm-hmm. I'm always cautious with this because um, – uh, like I've said before, it just so it varies so much depending on the power relationship that's there, and and the job security 
of that person. And again, I think we're, what we're doing is placing the mother and the families in this position where they're having to choose, <clears throat> which is um, unacceptable, really. Is that why you think there are some women who've decided that they don't want to return to work or they don't, they can't afford to return to work because those policies aren't really, really looking after them in a way that it should be? I think so, but I think it's more the, the other side, other direction. I think families are choosing and not continuing to breastfeed or reducing their breastfeeding um, to fit in with the employment because particularly in the current climate that we've got now, um, they can't afford not to work and so um, they need to work. Mm -hmm. It's the same story. You could ask the same question about what the policies are, what policies are there to childcare services. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to ask your childcare service what policies they've got around um, breast milk um, because if you're delivering breast milk with your baby um, and that's part of the care package and you're wanting the care, facility, care providers to provide that breast milk, then you need to know what sort of policy, what sort of practices are going on around that. Mm -hmm. And now this slides in very well with the next section, which is the questions from the audience. Um, there are a few questions. Some of them I've already asked. Some of them are very similar to what I have already asked. Some I slipped in because I felt like it fit really well. Um, so the first question that I will ask, is there any specific pumping schedule or routine that can sort of help optimize milk production and sort of make pumping at work more efficient? Uh, depends on the age of the baby, depends on the age and how long you've been breastfeeding for. So those first six weeks, so before I start, it's really uh, to, to get the most out of this, read as much as you can about how milk's made how your body mm -hmm. makes the milk. So learn about how your body's actually producing milk, what encourages that, what um, inhibits that. So stress inhibits the letdown reflex and so that stress could be anything. It could be uh, sitting by your desk um, with the, all your colleagues around you. So you might feel really stressed by that so you're not going to be able to have a letdown reflex. Um, and so you won't be able to get the milk out. So learning about as much as about how your body functions and about how the baby feeds is really important. And so finding a really good resource that can help you learn about that because then that helps you with your control. So then you have control um, and can manage, have autonomy over where you do it, how often you mm -hmm. do it. How often you should, like I said, it's really a hard question because it does change depending on the baby. Generally speaking, if a baby's feeding three, three, every three or four hours, then you really need to keep the sort of same pattern going. So you need to be expressing sort of the same sort of pattern um, mm -hmm. it, uh, to keep your breast milk up. Some women, I think like you said before, will, f will, will do something else during the day and then just breastfeed at night. Um, mm -hmm. uh uh, so they might express at work, do a bit of mixture of everything, express at work, and then just breastfeed physically at night. Um, that's that's uh, actually quite a good thing to do. So express during the day and breastfeed at night because some of your hormones to, that produce your milk are highest at night. So that bumps just keeps your supply up. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a question about how do I keep my supply up um, to be able to do this for as long as I want to do it for. Um, Okay. Um, and in terms of handling and storing and transporting breast milk, because that is a very interesting thing, <laughs> how do I handle storing and transporting breast milk safely while I'm away from my baby during working hours? So um, it depends on the climate you live in, of course. So the, there's lots of fantastic storage um, uh, companies that now make um, fantastic little storage uh, containers for this purpose and amazing pumps 
for example, we had a mum who used to pump driving to work. So she did. <laughs> so there's lots of fantastic things out there. It's a matter of just researching which one that uh, you can afford and also which mm-hmm. one suits you. Mm-hmm. Um, freezing your breast milk and then defrosting it at work in the fridge um, is often a good way. Pumping it and then directly popping it in the fridge and then take, taking it home um, as long as that's done, you know, within a certain time period, that's fine. Um, the best sort of advice I can give around that is go to, for example, the uh, your breastfeeding association. So there's usually one in every country um, that has that named up and listed. So they often have exactly the what's required, the temperature required and how to store and how to freeze um, and print that off and stick it on your fridge. Mm-hmm. So you know exactly, so you get to know. So this is really about you doing some legwork, figuring out, which I think parents are really good at doing, on figuring out how best to negotiate the requirements of keeping your breast milk safe within your context. So if it's really hot, you need the freezer bag. If you live where I live in winter, you don't need a freezer bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, how can I manage the emotional aspect of leaving my baby and also expressing at work, especially if I experience separation anxiety or even guilt? I think, I think each and every parent that's listening would have experienced every single one of those could be up a tick, tick, tick. <laughs> I, it comes back to that support network, your partner or your friends that you can actually share those feelings with, knowing that they're normal. You're not uh, the ideology of bad mothers and good mothers and good dads and bad dads. You know, we need to leave that behind. Um, but sharing this is really important. So talking about it and uh, getting other people's perspective on that, but just even verbalizing it is really healthy. Mm-hmm. Guilt is just something that is parceled um, with being a parent. I think it's in very fine print on the best certificate of every every child. <laughs> um, okay. And so it doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. Every parent, I really do truly believe, every parent sets out to do the right thing by their child. Everyone makes mistakes. There's no rule book here. Um, and so we all muddle along. Equipping yourself with as much information, peer-reviewed or really well-resourced information, um, will help you negotiate the uncertainties and help you rationalise those feelings of um, abandonment or feelings of guilt. Um, that feeling of of not being the one to provide the care to your child and going to work instead is is a really complex one. Um, it, like I said, it's not about whether you, it's not about good and bad. Um, it's about you're trying to do the best thing by by in your situation. And for that situation, it's you returning to work. It doesn't mean that you're not going to provide them with everything that they need when you're face to face. It's just at that period of the day so that you're needing to do something there so you're providing an income so you can pay the rent or buy the food, et cetera. So you're still meeting need. It's just that you're not together at that point to do that. Um, and But I think that probably the, the best thing is to talk about it. And if it really starts to weigh on you, make you feel sad, then seeking out some Um, extra support, so getting some uh, counselling, getting going on a a care plan to to negotiate this space in your life, which is emotionally taxing um, all the time and always will be. And I think one of the most sort of questions that I really wanted to ask and question that I think I got in a very different variations throughout the audience um, is 
how can I ensure a smooth transition from exclusively breastfeeding to pumping and bottle feeding when I return to work? That's a great question. Um, the smooth trans transition, it starts again, and I, I keep sort of coming back to this, is what you want this to look like. Mm -hmm. So if you are going back to work within, so that one or two Australian women actually go back to work with, after the first six months who have been in paid employment uh, during their pregnancy. And so they're making that transition and that might look like sort of starting to practice this expressing. So not leaving the expressing to the, the day before you go back to work. So practice it throughout that sort of period when you are at home. Um, and so you might getting to know what, how your body's working, getting to know how your baby feeds. So spending that, that, that period is really important for that, that time of getting to know each other and how your body's working and like we said before breastfeeding is incredibly complex and dynamic so it's always going to change and it changes with the needs of the baby and so the baby grows the type of breast milk that's made from your body changes um, the amount taken off by your baby changes and so it's so variable but that intimate time that you've had together will actually teach you a lot <laughs> and so being thinking about it in that term is really good so and then practice so just practice expressing see how it feels like what it feels like some people well in fact all of the women we've interviewed just really detest um, pumping they see it as a necessary thing to enable them to do what they need to do but the practicing and this comes from our research practicing that uh, um, expressing is what helped them manage that transition. So as far as evidence based, that seems to be the thing that women uh, have relied on um, and so that they may uh, learn how to do this so that it's less stressful when they actually go to work. Going into the workplace, making a visit to the workplace, so one's practicing, one's going into the workplace prior and connecting up with your workplace prior. This again comes from our research. Connecting up with your manager, telling them you're coming back, telling them, reminding them what you need. You need a safe place, da 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 da, -da. You're entitled to lactation breaks in most in, in employment sites, um, knowing what they are. And so then making a site visit. So go and bring your baby in, go and have a look and see what it feels like. Also includes, again, it comes back to what you want that to look like. You might mix between expressing and your partner might bring a baby, your baby in to breastfeed. Where are you going to do that? And where is your partner going to sit while you do that? Um, those are the, probably the two most important things. And then, again, think about how long you want to do this for. So mm -hmm. do you want to keep breastfeeding in some way to the 12-month period, to the two-year period, three-year period? Have a think about how long you want that to work. And also your diet, so making sure that you're eating well, that you're saving a bit of place for yourself in your life, so doing something nice for yourself so that you reward yourself. That's really important and we often forget to do that. So those, I think that, did I say four or three? Three things really. Um, practice, doing, figuring out what the work is, your workplace, the site, site where you're going to be doing this is like, so you need a fridge, you need a place to express, you need storage um, uh, and uh, including how your partner is going to, what role they're going to play in this and then looking after yourself, so doing something for yourself each day. There was a, um, just before I finish, when I had my third child, there was a midwife who said to me, um, and I've never forgotten this, she said, the most important thing you can do for yourself is do something for yourself every, every day. And so I couldn't manage to do that, but I did do something for myself every single week and continue to do that. And so I paint my nails once a week. And it's been something that I've done ever since I had my third child. And it's been the thing that I've kept um, as a little thing. And this is, I'm doing this for myself. So that thing that you do for yourself doesn't have to be this mammoth um, event. 
It can just be something that you know that is just a bit of self-care and that of, often will help that emotional struggle you always feel when you're negotiating breastfeeding work and, and paid work, I think. Well, that is a, that's very good steps. I think I especially love the self-care attached to it. I think we sort of neglect that part when we're always just doing things to other people, whether it's work, whether it's um, newly figuring out how to handle a child and be responsible for a child. I think we sort of neglect um, taking care of ourselves as well. And I think that's something that we underestimate its importance. So now we're going to go into the last section, which is the open mic. It gets you to talk about anything that you are passionate about, um, something that you want to talk and share with the audience. It can be related to the topic, doesn't have to be related to the topic. Um, so yeah, in the last like few minutes or so, I think the last minute, I would love to give you the floor and share something with the audience that you would love to talk about. Um, what I'm passionate about. Well, it probably comes through as a theme as we've been talking about this today. Um, I'm passionate about um, women and um, as a feminist, I that I really, I think all my work and everything that I've done, um, my philosophy, even how I've raised my children is really about um, making sure that women have some sort of equality and equity in their lives. And, and so that's probably what drives me the most, I think, um, that, uh, and I sort of use the word passion a bit loosely. It's more of a, because I think passion sometimes clouds your judgment a little bit. So I'm a, I try and pull back a little bit so I don't become one of those ranting <laughs> Fists okay. waving in the air, um, but very pro women and a pro their having them having a voice. Um, but that doesn't neglect how important it is to for others in your life to have the same sort of um, power and that the same sort of um, voice. But I think historically, just women ha have not been listened to, have not been taken seriously, and we're still struggling today with that issue. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the not naming up of partners that are necessary um, elements in helping women return to work is, is a sort of sleight of hand, oh, we don't really take you seriously yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the other thing I probably take really, I, I take, uh, um, I'm very committed to is planting trees. And so I'm very committed to planting trees to sort of grow back what we've destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're probably the two things that I think that are most important to me, I think, apart from my family, of course. Yep. <laughs> no, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I love the idea of, I think, I think we need to fight for, it's amazing how much we fought for already generations before us and how much we're still needing to fight. And you sort of expect it to be us having to fight a little less, but there is still that, um, that need for us to, to prove to everyone that we can do things that we can be amazing, that we can be incredible. And, um, I think women's rights is one of the biggest things for me as well. I love talking about it. I can get wrapped up in talking about it to a point where a lot of my um, male friends, they're like, Dina, we get it. We know, we know that you're, we know that you're supporting women no matter what. And I'm like, of course we are like, of course. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very interesting topic to sort of focus on. And um, I think we sort of neglect talking about certain aspects, like talking about breastfeeding and normalizing that conversation, for example, I think it's something that we definitely should be doing. And I'm glad, like, again, I'm glad that we had this conversation 
today and I'm glad we got to I'm glad I got to sort of express the definition of what breastfeeding no. is because I think that is a very big part of what we do and what we're talking about and what parenting and families are because it's a natural part of being a family it's a natural part of being a parent um it's something that we sort of take for granted in a way which is very interesting so I'm glad we got to sort of romanticize it for a little bit. For a couple of hours, we got to romanticize the idea of what breastfeeding is and look into it a little bit more in depth and scientifically than we usually would see it. So saying that, I thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining me on the show today and for talking about breastfeeding. Also introducing us to a whole scientific way of how breastfeeding is. It's not just something that happens. It's something that we really have to um, take on and understand a little bit more. So thank you so much for opening up the conversation on our show today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dina. Um, so if there's a way that audience members would like to get in contact with you to talk about breastfeeding a little bit more or even to ask questions that I probably have missed, um, is there a way that they are able to get to reach you? Yeah, sure. They can certainly email me at my email address, which is jennifer.aton at utas, U-T-A-S dot E-D-U dot A-U. Very happy to have a conversation or be, um, uh, you know, be contacted. That'd be terrific. Okay, perfect. Well, I will have the link to your email down below in the YouTube and our YouTube channel in the description. So if there's easy access, if you're wanting to contact Jennifer, definitely go there. Um, yeah, definitely go and check out some of her re some of her work as well. I think there's a lot there that can be explored even further, and even extensively, and you can ask questions as well. So definitely go reach out to her. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. And of course, I will see you guys in the next episode. You've been listening to Raising Parents. The Parenting Science Insights Podcast, produced by the Parenting Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 Life Management Perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at pa.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent, and thanks for tuning in.